Welcome to another episode of the Concrete Logic Podcast. And today I have Jim Kaler with Durability Consultants with me, and we're going to discuss ASTM F6, which is the Committee on Resilient Floor Coverings, and ASTM F710, the standard practice for preparing concrete floors receive to receive resilient flooring. So Jim's going to help me understand what those two things are and help you all understand as well. But before I get started, my favorite part of the podcast recently is getting you guys to understand how the podcast works and how you can su support the show. So there are three ways you can su support the show. One is please, if you get some kind of value out of this, don't be selfish. Share this podcast episode with one of your colleagues or a coworker. The second way you can help out is if you go to concretelogicpodcast.com, there's a couple ways you can reach out to me. You can hit contact, which will email me, or there's a little uh, microphone at the bottom right-hand side of the page. You can leave me a voicemail that way. And what I'm looking for help with is ideas for topics or guests. So most of the folks that are on this podcast are suggestions from listeners or past guests. That say, hey, you should talk to so-and-so. Hey, you should talk to Jim Kaler. Or you should cover concrete moisture. Things like that that you all want to learn about, please reach out. Let me know what you want want to uh, hear on the show because this podcast is for you all. And then the last thing you can do is you can, on the same homepage of ConcreteLogicPodcast.com, in the upper right-hand corner, there's a donate button. Do and that donation button is there is for folks. If you get some kind of value out of this show and you want to give to the show, you can click on that and give any dollar amount. And any dollar amount is, uh, is, you know, just any amount is good enough for me. It does, whatever you get out of the show, be a dollar, five dollars, five hundred dollars, whatever it is, feel free to uh, do that. And you're probably like, Seth, that's a crazy idea. Sounds novel. Well, it's not. I stole it from somebody else, and I'm going to give them a shout-out. I was wondering at what point I was going to give these people a shout-out. But if you all should check out No Agenda Podcast, it's got Adam Curry and John C. Dvorak on there, and they've been doing this value-for-value value model where uh, their listeners donate to their show for the last 16 years. So this is not something new. I didn't make this up. This really works. So check it out. And then with that, Jim, let's let's dive right into F6 and F710, which are ASTM. Uh, what are they? Can you explain it? Maybe we should start off with, what the heck is ASTM and why should we care about ASTM? Good question. Uh, yeah, ASTM, American Standards Testing and Materials. God, how do you wrap up ASTM, huh? That's interesting. I guess everything that we make in the construction industry at some point goes through ASTM. I know like when you go and do yard work, you get the plastic PVC piping from Home Depot, and it'll have an ASTM on there. So I don't know. I hate to say like everything's certified because that's maybe not super accurate, but the overriding governing body over just about every construction material, I would think. Um, I think that's safe. I sit on uh, a number of the a ASTM CO9 concrete and aggregates. Uh, D08 is waterproofing. D30 is composites. Uh, GFRP bar I have an interest in. EO6 is overall building science, building health, if you will. F6, as you mentioned, is the flooring uh, group. And then GO1 uh, is corrosion. And those are the groups that I, like I said, I think I'm at least a voting member on at least one committee. But again, for me, it's a little ADD-ish. It's more of, I don't want to be the guy that has the expertise necessarily to guide it. But in my industry, I want to know where it's going before it goes there. So I'm like the voyeur. I'm there. But I'm not there. I have an opinion on certain things. I know I have a pretty good background in concrete and cement chemistry. But beyond that, 
if you're talking about waterproof membranes, I almost always abstain in my votes unless you're an expert in that field. I feel you should, like me, stand back and watch the work reports that are done. When something, it doesn't just happen. There's reports that are drafted by committees. They go back and forth. They vote on it. There's negatives. It's a whole process. Then they sit down and it's mind numbing. They go over the English language and convention of A's and they's. And you go through that whole thing. And then a report is published. And these things do not move quickly. They move like glaciers do. But there's some method to that madness too. Our industry is very old, very conservative. You don't want some newfangled thing coming down the pike. Everybody jumps on board. So the ship moves very slowly. But I think that's probably a good thing too. So yeah, I, I sit on a number of committees. Again, I don't give the impression like I'm driving the boat, but I'm more just a passenger. I'm just watching. Um, I'll give you an example. I think, again, when I talk about some of the, the monotony involved in it a few years ago, the fly ash guys, there's no secret, particularly here on the West Coast, fly ash is running out. We've done a, an excellent job, if you will, of taking the fly ash, the product of burning coal, and burying it in our concrete. Now, with that said, there's a lot of benefits to the concrete, posolonic activity, it tightens it, densifies it, uh, probably makes it more durable, obviously more sustainable, uh, but we don't have much of it. So now they want to go and broaden the definition. They want to take the bottom ash and the, the middle part of it. I, I don't want to be hyper dramatic, but I mean, it almost breaks into fistfights in the back of these committee meetings and stuff. And that's about as exciting as it gets. So, uh, yeah. It's a very slow moving. So I just want to paint the picture here, uh, what we're dealing with, the animal. What type of folks are on these committees? You have a little bit of everything. Obviously, I'm a consultant, but again, that's just a fancy way. I'm a peddler. I'm a salesman. So you have people like me would be like distributors or manufacturer representatives. And then you have a whole engineering community. You get a lot of folks from the universities, the colleges who are doing primary research. And again, these are the guys that usually have uh, PE after their name, SE, PhD, wear blue blazers, and are overall pretty sharp guys. Yeah. So it's conglomeration, contractors, suppliers, designer specifiers in the engineering community. So it's eclectic, to say the least. And uh, this ASTM F6 committee, they just cover resilient floor coverings. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. The, the backstory is such the greening of the planet, if you will. Back in the late 90s, there's no secret, they outlawed uh, paints and solvent-based, oil-based products. It's Before I was old and fat, I used to race a bicycle around. I rode a bicycle quite a bit, and we used to paint our bikes. And then after a while, almost overnight, you'd set your bike and you'd get a scratch. So we all moved over and we, we get our stuff powder-coated now. But that's no secret. They just took out all the solvents, the heavy VOCs, and the paints almost overnight deteriorated. Well, that didn't just happen with the paints. That happened with coatings, adhesives, all, all kinds of stuff. So now you have all of your resilient flooring. That's something that's uh, allergen, very high hygiene in hospitals, universities, stuff like that. They don't really breathe well. So now you take your adhesive. They go from a solvent oil base to a water based almost overnight. So this is probably what, maybe 98, 99. They didn't outlaw it. That's not technically correct. But they basically made, if you did continue oil based, the registration of the process, the hoops you had to jump through were so intense that for all practical purposes, they forced it out. So now all of your adhesive for your floor companies, big floor companies, overnight goes to a water base. Uh, 50, 60% in some instances. So then we ran into a whole issue where you took uh, your concrete, you build in your building, and you have your construction cycle. And obviously, if you <laughs> got to be around a superintendent for 10 minutes and you know everything's late and should have been in yesterday. So you have a very abbreviated construction schedule and they go to put their floor on. And these adhesives aren't the same. You used to be able to take what they call cutback. This was vicious stuff. You could open a container like across the street from where you live and you would smell this. <laughs> it would 
your eyes would water, curl your toes. But the beauty of it was you could stick vinyl to steel underwater. This stuff was amazing. Uh, now, there's probably some health benefits, and I don't mean to minimize that. You're talking about some pretty strong stuff. But that all of a sudden disappears, and you have an oil-based adhesive, or excuse me, a water-based adhesive. There's all kinds of problems. Floors blistered. They peeled off. Uh, moisture came up through the concrete, either from the concrete itself in some instances, or from the sub-base, Mother Earth, uh, the whole thing. And the, it would, I want to say, uh, re-emulsified whether the glue actually set and went back into liquid form gets very technical, but it re-emulsifies. And then these floors come up and got into by about 2001, 2002, there were some serious issues around the world, not just in this country. So that's where the F6 committee, I think, was always there. That is the resilient flooring, as you said. But that really what launched them into the, the spotlight saying, okay, guys, we're into billions of dollars. I know a guy who worked for Forbo, a beautiful flooring company. He was a master mechanic. They put him on a jet. He would fly all over the planet and go, yep, your floor's coming up. You've got a problem. But it took a while to figure out what that problem was, the moisture. Was it from the concrete? Was it coming through the sub base? The sub base, you had folks like Stego, what you call class A vapor retarder, vapor barrier retarder, you get into that whole uh, dialogue. But that takes the play, properly installed, that takes the play out of all the moisture coming up from Mother Earth. So then you have moisture within the concrete, and they look to F6. My critique has been rather harsh at times, but I don't know if the F6 initial concern was to fix the problem or was there more of a cottage industry that developed that made a lot of money from diagnosing the problem? That is, you could go hire any of those guys on there and fly them out and pay them <laughs> heavy expenses, and they would look and say, yeah, your floor's coming up. You have a problem. That's nice. You and I both know, so you're not fixing anything. Uh, you know, you write a whole report on what you could have done, what you should have done, what you think the problem was. And again, I want to be very fair. It took a while. Nobody really knew for a while, for a few years. Today, it's easy to look back, right? Everybody knows how San Francisco should have played the last Super Bowl. We're all experts at that, right? They just played the Super Bowl. But it, it took a while, but they let it go on for years and years where there was guys that this cottage industry of consultants just basically show up saying, yeah, you've got a problem. And it's moisture. Could be coming from A, B, C, or D. That I think I've been critical of. Uh, I think it's a fair criticism. And then you mentioned F710, and you can read that document if you've got it pulled up. But that's really what they, the product of them going, okay, you guys are in charge at the ASTM level of flooring, resilient flooring and coatings. You got to put terrazzo, you got to put some of the high uh, traffic area coatings, epoxies in there. Uh, roofing kind of falls under that universe too. And then they come up with the F710 document, which is a guidebook. And it says, okay, if you do this, then the assumption is, is that you will have a successful floor, flooring installation in years of, of perfect service. I, again, was very critical. There's a section in there that says you shall test for moisture. Now, you use the word shall. I think that's pretty beaten out in the courts. That means it's mandatory that it's, you have to do it. Well, if I tell you, you have to do this, Seth, you have a reasonable feeling, expectation that if you do it, you'll be successful. And that's when you get into in situ relative humidity. The Wagner meters came out very popular. Drill a hole, you're into the top third of the concrete. You let it uh, reach some type of equilibrium. You put a, a probe in there and you get a percentage, 75%. That was the kind of, I don't know, almost like a holy <laughs> scripture coming down from the mountain. First of all, 75% is not realistic. If you talk to the gurus, the, the pros, right? The Tyler Lays, uh, Jason Weiss, David Trejo, we mentioned my three heroes, usually between about 85 to 80%. And even below 80%, all the really cool magic and concrete ceases. There's just not enough moisture. It, it doesn't produce more cement 
product is a good thing. That's what you want, right? Concrete gets harder, it gets stronger, it densifies, it's less permeable, all the good stuff that we want. So to say that 75% you have to hit that, in my career, probably what, 15 years now, going on 16 years, I've seen a lot of floors that have failed that had reached that 75%. And again, these are moving targets. First of all, when you build a, a project, most of the time, these areas are not acclimated. You don't have the skin on, the doors, the windows, the walls, everything. The HVAC is on where you can keep a, a controlled environment. So to say that because you went yesterday morning or yesterday afternoon and you got 75%, and then I sent a team in this morning to put the floor on. Goodness, there was massive failures. It just it, it didn't work. And it would be the same thing with the calcium chloride. That was one of the other two tests, right? You properly done. That's a huge statement. You grind, you open up the capillaries on the surface of the concrete. I don't know if I've ever seen that done. You put a uh, little Petri dish, sodium, excuse me, sodium calcium hydroxide, excuse me, no. Gosh, what am I? The old Petri dish, yeah, where they, they weigh the material, you put it on the concrete and it pulls the moisture out. Then you weigh it and you get that difference. That is pounds per square foot per 24 hours, per thousand square feet. And you get a number, three pounds. That's the whole, that, that's the, again, handed down from the mountain. I've seen a lot of floors fail that were at some point on the surface, three pounds per 24 hours per thousand square feet. Again, depending on when you did that, what part of the slab, there's all kinds of factors. And these floors failed. My critique of the F6 folks is that I don't think even to this day that they've moved in a direction we are actually fixing the problem. Then you get into dew points. There's a number of things that come into play when you install flooring and your adhesive isn't a fraction of what it used to be. I think there's a lot of folks that made a lot of money and I don't know if they really fixed the problem or just explain it to you in really nice literary terms. I think the point of the ASTM is to give us something that we can, for the flooring, example is have a test that confirms that we are doing something right. We're installing when we're supposed to, we're using the right materials, doing the right tests is the point of the ASTM. It almost like the, from your story, what you're explaining to me, and I'm sorry, I have not read the F710 paper. That's why I brought you here. <laughs> but it, it sounds like from these, and there's been, a, we've had a, a, other guests on the show and we've we've referenced standards before they, they try to simplify a process that might not necessarily achieve the goal of the group and they're trying to make it as simple as possible is that what is happening in um, in, in I, this I, particular I would, instance i would agree with that seth i think that's probably a diplomatic way of saying it these are vastly complicated but again i, I think when you put out a mandate. And I think that 710 document is key. I had some products that I felt addressed the issue. And I went on a circuit for a long time, Lunch and Learns, and talked about this. You should be very familiar with F710. I think some of the other ACI documents, I think, did a, a, a good job as well as they could have to try to address this and talk about some of the circumstances, how to control your environment. But again, I, th I think this process, it's 2024 now, this problem really manifested, I think the inventories ran up in about 2000, 2001. So we're well past two decades, we're past 20 years now. So if I tell you something, Seth, you shall do this, you do that, and you still have catastrophic failures it's a tough conversation. Again, I don't want to beat a dead horse. I lived in this universe. There's very serious meetings when you have, say, 150, 200,000 square foot building. And one of the last things you have to do is to install your floor, maybe touch up a little paint, throw on the kick plates there on the outlets, and then you toss the owner the keys. And your only fix is a six, seven, eight dollars a square foot fix to come in to bead blast that floor, to put in some type of epoxy remediation, two-part epoxy, 
Nothing sticks to epoxy, so then you need an SLU, self-leveling underlayment, cementitious, and then put your floor on. On a good day, that's probably $7 a square foot. And you're in those meetings and the architects there and the general contractors there, the flooring installer, the concrete guy, and everyone's got his head down. Who's going to go to Mr. Owner for that million dollar check? Man, those are tough conversations to have when you're 90 some percent on the building. So again, I don't want to be hyper dramatic, but these are serious. The construction schedule, the time, the monies involved to fix this problem are substantial. And when I go to bed at night, I just don't have that warm feeling that F6 was uh, out there really trying to fix the problem mm -hmm. as they should have. So, and again, people like me who joined the committee, it, it's a long process. And we've seen this in a number of issues to go and show the testing, to, to bring a consortium and say, hey, this is a problem. This is a good fix here. This might be a fix here. And let's introduce that. Again, I have to think that there's a lot of individuals that is counterproductive to their, their benefit and probably haven't reacted in the most prudent quick fashion uh, that I think the circumstances deserve. When did this F710 come out, the latest one? I think probably 2019. I think there's an issue, it's, and it's always coming out. I talked the other day, I served lunch to the Port of Los Angeles, and obviously the big ACI is always 318. That's what ties all the structural engineering together in concrete. They're still having seminars on how to decipher ACI 318-19 came out, what, five years ago. So again, I don't want to minimize this as a process. Uh, sometimes it's very complex, but it's been a few years. It's been a while. The latest revision was December 20. I just did a quick search. Okay. So a year and a half, yeah. Good. But th these jobs, they don't adopt them right away, right? Well... Theoretically, as soon as the document is issued, it's published. And again, like I said, they've been working on that probably since 19. There's a whole process. And part of that process, again, is the words. And I don't mean to minimize that. I wasn't the greatest English student. Now I have spell check on my computer and my phone. But yeah, it, it's a substantial process just where they put a they, a the, uh, again, show the, the, the language. Uh, it takes a while. It is a process. But again, if you looked at the latest thing from, say, say it was came out in 18 and again in 22, there's probably not a whole lot. There's probably only a few sections that have been modified, have been altered. So again, you got to keep that in mind. It's not like they're drafting a whole new guideline, a whole new proposal. These are modifications. And there's been quite a few. If you went back and looked at all the 710, I, I bet you there's a dozen probably in the last 20 years. Right. 25 years. The current procedure right now for 710, you mentioned that they're, they're taking a core of the floor. What's Not so much a core. You can if you have a big problem. What they're doing, they're saying you should test for moisture. Uh -huh. The flooring manufacturers, and I think you have to put a lot of the onus back on them, they haven't really – it's calcium chloride was, I think, earlier I was struggling. Uh, a lot of different elements in my head. Uh, calcium chloride, I think they're saying is it's too subjective where I could go do calcium chloride with a little Petri dish where I weigh it and then I put a dome over it and cock it down. I come back, I put it on a scale, I have my little formula and I get a number three pounds is always it. I think the flooring industry at this point has pretty much abandoned that, that it, it's one tool and a lot of flooring guys will still use it, but whether you get two pounds Per thousand square feet for 24 hours, you would get six pounds. I don't think that's the main measuring guide. I think the industry has circled back to that. And again, all you can see is the flooring manufacturers have taken it out of their instructions. A lot of this goes back to the flooring guys too. Make no mistake about it. If you ask me about, say, an admixture I sell, I'm the manufacturer. I'm the distributor manufacturer. Uh, I'm going to tell you use 10 ounces per hundredweight, such and such, that falls on me. Now you can go back and read uh, ACI, that was a 212 on, on admixtures, but you, you probably want to listen to me more than you want to read that and see what they have to say as far as certain things. So I want to be clear on the culpability. I think the flooring manufacturers 
for a long time drag their feet as to really the remedy and, and how to fix this. Mm-hmm. If you want to put floor down, you're going to go to the manufacturer and say, okay, what's your protocol? That makes sense, right? And then there's the whole game, the shell game on warranties. There is no moisture. There's not one manufacturer of any flooring company. Uh, it could be wood. It could be rubber, cork, bamboo. It could be anything. Nobody warrants against moisture. And I think that's a shell game too. They say, well, if you get to three pounds or 75%, you, you get to these things. And then you go back and test and the moisture redistributes. Guarantee you're going to be at least 76% or maybe higher. And then the finger pointing and all that. So, again, I, I just think it was a really kind of murky, dark, swampy area for a long time that should have been sorted out a lot faster than it was. Because, again, there's that whole perception. If you go to a manufacturer, if I do everything you say, right, like the report says, you shall do this, then I get some type of consideration that it's going to work. If, if the floor fails, Armstrong, Mo, any of the, the major guys, nobody gives you a flooring warranty. The contractor, the installer, he might step up. He's saying, hey, I did this per the manufacturer. I did this by industry standards, i.e. 710. So I, I will come back for a year. And I will, but even that, you're, you're into a murky area. You think a flooring guy is going to take responsibility for the concrete that was poured? Maybe it was a 0.45 water cement mix design. Maybe the guy, the inspector went home, it got late, it was a Friday afternoon. Maybe they went up to a 0.55. Are you going to take, if you're a flooring guy, Seth, the flooring installer, are you going to take responsibility for that? Probably not. So it's a bit of a circle jerk. And yeah, it's cost the industry a lot of time. I think a lot of money, both directly and indirectly. We know there's all kinds of costs involved. And yeah, I can't say as the F6 can look in the mirror and feel real good about the way they've represented it. So if you had it your way, what would the, the uh, 710 well, I say? Would go back again, my, that's probably self-serving. I like, you had a guest on a while back, Dean Kraft. Um, he has a company, he makes a chemical and admixture. He feels that he has a good approach to the problem. He did, I think, the responsible thing. And I've told Dean a number of times, we happen to be friends. I don't know if I could do what he's done. He joined the committee. He spent his time, his dues. He's a voting member. He went in, I believe it's the water drop. There's a, another whole piece to this that nobody discusses. Is the surface of the concrete, is it permeable? Is it non-permeable? Is it absorptive? Is it non-absorptive? Again, that has to do with the type of adhesive you use. When you're in concrete, my God, it, it's almost like a braggadocious. I did a few years back via Viacom down in San Diego, North County, big, beautiful campus, huge. And uh, Qualtech, they went back and forth on this slab. They burned it in so tight. I was kidding the guys to shoot numbers. I wanted to see the FF and the FL numbers. It was beautiful. But there's a certain counterintuitiveness to that. If you turn your blades up and you burnish a floor, and then you want to come back and stick a floor to that? Think about it. It, it, Would you rather something that was just bull floated like your sidewalk? You think a floor would stick better to that? Or something that highly burned in like a mirror, like your garage floor? That's, to me, somewhat counterintuitive. So there's a test, and Dean Kraft, I think, stepped in. He put his committee together. He had all of his voting. He went back to the drawing board a couple times. And I would venture to say it was probably just barely two years where he introduced the test where you take a drop of water and you drop it on the surface of the concrete and you wait a few seconds and either that water absorbs into the surface or it just beads up on the surface. And again, that's either porous, non-porous, and that has dictates on what kind of adhesive you use. I like that. I think to take that out of 710 and say, no, this isn't just a procedure. This is an important piece on its own. Is that surface porous or non-porous? And here's the test. That's position A. I give Dean tremendous credit, although I never tell him to his face, but yeah, um, we're too good of friends for that. But to me, that's how you move the needle is you sit on the committee. I was talking to the guys the other day on LinkedIn. There's a nice group and they were saying how internal cure 
can take the place of regular surface curing, wet cure? And I says, well, in some instances, probably. But you have to get on the committee and you have to show your material, your testing. And let's face it, some of the best prima facie evidence is case study. Show me the jobs you've done. Because I believe that in a lot of sense, but I also know I spent my career starting with fiber mesh. We were the first really pioneer fibers in concrete. And my God, I've seen some horrible, unfortunately, you want to go to the industries that are very cost sensitive. A lot of that is residential and it's not the highest grade concrete. I've seen a lot of crack concrete. I did some projects out in July and August out in Mojave, California. You want to be real careful. You tell somebody not to use a surface cure, a wet cure in Mojave, California in August, man, you're a daredevil. I'm too old, too many scars, too many bruises. I would never do that. That doesn't mean there's not tremendous benefits in internal cure. Part of durability consultants, what I do is a lot of try to do third party testing, if you will. Maybe I'm second party or second and a half. But honestly, I only want to sell and represent the products in my heart that I know are effective. We've done a lot of testing back in 2019, some corrosion testing. Uh, made some concrete beams, put in some artificial cracks in those, uh, took some sloppy 10% salt water, went through a wet dry cycle and took a half cell and measured that. We still do that every few years. Looking at these products that are permanently, permeability reducing admixtures and doing testing. Again, there's huge differences where you live, Seth. And, and you said, Jim, I went out and I did this with 400 pounds of cement. I have my aggregate and all that. Where I live, the, the material is not that good. It's a whole different ballgame. So what you do in your backyard might be way, way different than what I do. We, I, I do a lot of work in Hawaii, incredibly interesting material in Hawaii. They bring a lot of their material from the Pacific Northwest. I worked for a company called Highcrete years ago. I really focused there, mostly because of the gentleman, Randy Cooley, very smart man. And I, so I'm privy to a lot of the testing. Well, they can do with 380 pounds of cement, what it would take me 600 pounds of cement to do. Their material is just far superior to our material down here. So again, the local testing and stuff, uh, that's key uh, in my mind, because again, that third party testing, that's where it's at. So take that to these areas around the country, do your homework, come to my backyard where the rule of thumb is like Seattle is the best, right? And then it gets progressively worse. Well, San Diego is worse than Los Angeles. That's some reprieve, but do your testing and bring it to these committees and then move the needle that way and say, hey, there's times where I might not need uh, an external water cure where an internal cure will suffice. Make that case, plead your case, like what Dean Kraft did. I think that to me, that's position A. Yeah. This F710 paper, does it address anything other than the concrete? Does it look at the whole entire process of install installing the floor or does it just look concrete is the problem? This is how you solve the concrete problem by testing it and applying the floor at this date and time or when it meets this threshold. Oh, and that's an excellent question, too. It's rather insightful, Seth, because, again, as I mentioned, C09 is the ASTM universe on concrete and aggregates. F6, they're flooring guys. Now, it's not to say that Peter Craig and, and Scott Tarr, these guys, they have a, a, a decent background in concrete, but yet you, you, you're bringing two different systems in. You're, you have two different universes. How many flooring guys do you know are experts on concrete? Probably not a whole lot. So, yeah, so it goes back to my initial thought. Are you going to put a flooring installer on the hook for the C8? C8 is a licensed concrete contractor in the state of California. Is he on the hook for all the means and methods that guy did? That's not fair. That's a tough sell. That's just yeah. not in the universe, right? You don't put the concrete guy on the hook for the flooring guy. So you're mixing expertise. You're mixing systems. You're mixing products. And I think that's one of the things that the ASTM has to grapple with. Well, I think there's two ways you can fix this problem. The first way, if we got to go through this committee way, 
Well, no, I'm not even going to go there. There, The two ways in my simple way of thinking is on your jobs, when you have this, these areas of the floors in these buildings where you're going to put something on concrete, you're going to put some kind of flooring on concrete, you got to have that pre-pour meeting. And you got to drag the flooring guy into the meeting. And I could probably count on maybe one hand that I've seen a flooring guy come to one of these pre-pour meetings because they're like, ah, they're talking about concrete. What the hell do I need to come in there and talk about resilient flooring? But that guy needs to be there so we can all coordinate the floor finish. So Jim, like you were saying, are we bull floating this thing? Are we grooming? What are we doing where this certain floor is going to put down? That needs to be established. and. In that pre-pour meeting, too, we all need to talk about what the temperature of the cured concrete, what temperature is that concrete going to be? What temperature is the glue that we're putting down? What is that going to be? What temperature the floor is going to be? When are we bringing all this stuff in? When are we going to give it time to acclimate to the building before we install it? All that needs to happen in a pre-pour meeting. You're preaching to the choir, brother. Gosh, you you sound like me. I'll let this out. I I do a lot of work in Bakersfield, and I have for a long time. Bakersfield, kind of Central Valley, California. Big produce. You think it's a big dry hole, but they've got some crazy hydraulics. I don't know if it's because of the farming or just Mother Nature as it rolls out to the sea. But for years, I have an admixture. It goes in the concrete, like you said, up front. Foreign guys nowhere around. But the good part is Bakersfield, it's like a little piece of Oklahoma right in the middle of California. Everybody knows everybody. So I've got to know there's only a handful of really key good installers. And they'll call me, the foreign guys. Hey, Jim, this is Brian over at Metro Floors. Did you did they use your admixture now? Yes, sir. He knows right there. He hangs up the phone. He doesn't have to spend any time testing. He knows if it does go wrong, it's, he's going to call me. I'm going to get the phone call. He doesn't have to do any of the stuff, the shawl test. You shawl test for moisture in F710 that we referenced earlier. He doesn't have to do calcium chloride. He doesn't have to do in situ relf humidity. He can just go prep and put his floor on. He's happy. He knows. I'm, we're like best friends. But yeah. if you don't know, if you weren't, at, like you said, there's never a flooring guy in that initial job site meeting. That never happens. I would probably faint. I would pass out from surprise. Uh, but that's the thing. Are you going to look at the 3,000 section of concrete? Are you going to look at the 7,000, the 9,000, the finishes and stuff? Nobody ever cross-references that. Yeah. You put my admixture in that concrete, you have to wait a reasonable time, three, four weeks. But you can put that flooring on, guaranteed. Guaranteed. And But that's it. How do you tie that message together? How do you go from the 3,000? We're a concrete guy. He wants to set forms. He wants to pour. He always wants to pour on Friday. He wants to come back, strip on Monday, and he's gone. He's nowhere to be seen by the time they get to, to putting the skin on the building and even talking about putting the floor on. He's long gone. He's got paid out. His 10% retention closed out a long time ago. Yeah. He, he might be in town working. He might be in Cancun fishing. Who knows? Yeah, you're, you're talking about different universes. And I think that's what you touched on, Seth, when you take F6 and FC09. I guarantee you the FC09 guys and the F6 guys, they don't know each other. I don't know your ad mixture. Never used it. Don't know if it works or anything. But even if it does work and it does, and I'm sure it does, it sounds like you've had great success with it. You're still only addressing the concrete, right? You're not addressing the adhesive that's going to be put down or the flooring. The owner is still exposed to that risk. If those two things are not handled right beyond what's going on with the concrete, you still could have a floor that fails. You're absolutely right. And those are good. And I think that's, (laughs) I've been around long enough since the 80s um, and I left for a little bit and I came back. There's always a saying, concrete admixture salesman, just like snake oil. You want to sell a lot of admixture, not sound like a concrete admixture salesman. Um, But with that said, you're absolutely right. You you still, you can't abandon good flooring practices. That is because you use my admixture, I'm not selling magic. You still need a conditioned space. You better bring your material, your floor and your adhesive in. Let it acclimate. You better be within a service range. You better be within a dew point range. I'm not a magician. You can't, I'm selling my admixture Probably it's about half a gallon in cubic yard. 
I'm all out of magic tricks. You can't, you still have to have a quality installer. I will uh, mitigate your risk. I will keep you on a construction schedule, but I'm not a magician. I don't work down at the magic castle there. So yeah, you can't cut corner. You can't bring some out of town guy, cut corners. If there's a problem, pick up the phone and call me because I do know enough on F6 sitting in there looking over everyone's shoulder. You still have to, you have to have good concrete practices. You have to have good flooring installation practices. And I think that's sometimes where the message gets missed. There's a little competitive factor. We can put your floor on in 28 days. Well, if you use my mixture, you can put it on in 21 days. Okay. But what's that seven days? What did that produce? Well, I don't have even less skin on the building. I certainly don't have the HVAC on. I don't have a conditioned space. So you want to be very careful of that. And I think that's sometimes the nature of things that can cause, like I said, the porosity of the surface, a dew point. If it's a certain temperature and that temperature goes down, you have moisture. Regardless of that, that's the other thing. The, the industry always compensates. You can go put your floor in at 25 pounds on the calcium chloride test. Well, 25 pounds, the only way you get to that would be underwater. You can go up to 100% relative humidity. Only way to get to 100% relative humidity is in water. You could be 99%, but 100% is water. You want, you're telling somebody to put their floor on in water? Man, you're a dangerous guy to me. I, you can never abandon the good concrete practices. And I think that's like go back to the curing compound, the last conversation I had with the guys. If you're going to focus and you're going to live outside of that ACI, that PCA, Portland Cement Association, ACI guidelines, you better be real upfront with the guy. If I sell you an ad mixture, I'm going to say, listen, I'm going to ask you, don't worry about F710. I'm going to step up. I'm better than F710. There really is no warranty. So listen to me. I think you need to, you owe the industry to be upfront about that. If you say, don't put a, a curing compound on, an external wet cure, use my product. It's going to lend an internal cure. I think you need to be upfront about that. Unless, like you said, you go sit on these committees and you move the needle. Yeah. Well, if, if we're installing things to just meet some paper or some standard, then I guess we're, we may be achieving that, but we're still having some problems. But I got one last solution. I said I had two, two ways to fix this problem. And the second way is... Just don't put anything on the concrete. Concrete's too pretty to cover up. You so go. then Try you don't have that problem. There's yeah. great guys out there that can polish concrete. They can paint the concrete, the dye the concrete. Yeah. So just don't cover it up. I with like that ugly, ugly. Yeah. Ugly floor. All right, man. Well, I think this is a good place to pause our conversation today. Jim, let, if folks want to reach out to you and learn more about what you do, what's the best way? Jim at Durability Consultants. Plural S dot com. All right. We'll put that in the show notes so folks can reach out to you. Jim, thanks for coming on the show. And until next time, folks, let's keep it concrete.